Roll call, please. Von Bergen. Here. Young. Here. Altoff. Here. Wedner. Here. Nowak. Here. Wilbeck. Thorson. Here. All right. We're calling, we're calling this meeting to order in accordance with McHenry County Board Chairman's declaration that meetings are not practical or prudent. This meeting will be conducted pursuant to Section 7E of the Open Meetings Act 5 IC, ILCS 120. Has everybody had an opportunity to uh, read the minutes? And if they did, could I have somebody motion to approve? Bob I'll makes the move. motion, and Tracy second it, seconds it. Can we have a roll call, please? Young. Yes. Von Bergen. Yes. Wagner. Yes. Altov. Yes. Nowak. Yes. Thorson. Yes. Okay, this is the time that we allot for public comment. Uh, do we have any public comment today, Scott? It doesn't look like it. No, sir. All right. Well, let's move right on to members' comments. Members? Seeing none. Now it's time for presentations. Are there any presentations? Seeing none. Let's move on to new business. Um, under resolution 6B1, resolution supporting the annual renewal of maintenance and support with Central Square Technologies for the Emergency Telephone System Board, E911, Public Safety Suite Software Modules. I'll make a motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a motion. John made the motion. Tracy made the second. Discussion? There being none, can we move to vote, please, by roll call? Did somebody raise their hand? I can't see Pam. So, Pam, you'll just have to chime in. I, I, I will, I'm sorry, and you would see me, but I just got back from um, a trip and I'm looking really road hard, sorry. What's my excuse? <laughs> Tiki is there. Okay, I'm sorry, what? Tiki is there. I, I can't even. I said Tiki is on my map. Tiki? Well, I'm here, know. I didn't know if anybody had any questions. We, just, I don't believe um, that. Annual maintenance. We do it every year. Right. It's over thirty thousand, so we have to bring a resolution forward. I don't see anybody uh, motioning to speak. So, uh, with that, I'd like to go to a roll call, please. Nowak. Yes. Wagner. Yes. Altoff. Yes. Young. Yes. Von Bergen. Yes. Thorson. Yes. Okay, item uh, 6B2, the resolution authorizing the purchase of seven Dodge Charger pursuit vehicles, two Dodge Ram pursuit vehicles, and one Dodge Durango pursuit vehicle from Sunnyside Company of McHenry, Illinois, per bid 21-4205 for the McHenry County Sheriff's Office. I'll make a motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Bob made the second. The floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it was so refreshing coming over here from next door. <laughs> oh. um, so this is an annual resolution where uh, we come to the board to replace uh, vehicles in our fleet. As you know, we have 500000 in the budget to do so every year. The fleet consists of 274 vehicles, uh, but that does include other departments right now. Um, we're going to try to split them off eventually from the 500,000 and replace them at different um, times just because there's different needs um, for someone who's driving like a planning and development vehicle versus a pursuit vehicle. But um, this year it was a little tricky. Uh, the manufacturers for the vehicles um, cut off our, our timeline for getting the vehicles. So we actually had to put the order in for these already just so that you guys know because they cut it off there. Uh, and right now they're not even allowing us to purchase any non-pursuit vehicles. They shut it off to all um, government. They're only doing non-pursuit vehicles for um, the private sector, um, the public folks. So this year, as usual, we had our fleet manager go through our fleet and look at what vehicles 
met the threshold either year-wise or mile-wise or if it was just a high-maintenance vehicle. And the suggestion was the seven Dodge Chargers, two Ram um, Pursuit trucks, and the one Dodge Durango. And this is also going to be coming from Sunnyside. They, they won the base bid. Any uh, questions, any discussion from the uh, committee? Uh, oh, Kelly, you're in the dark. Okay, hi, Kelly. Kelly. <laughs> yes, sorry. Yes, life's not good this morning. Yes, um, so, I was just wondering, you said Sunnyside won the bid. Usually we see um, on these proposals the other bids, and I don't see them. I just see Sunnyside. Um, on the procurement um, that was attached, um, the executive summary. Oh, I see it. I'm sorry. Oh. I was. No, that's okay. I was thinking it was something else. Sorry about that. That's okay. All good. Anything else? Anybody yeah. else? Can I just, Peter, just add quickly. You know, Sandra mentioned we have 500,000 set aside for vehicles. This is not exhaust that 500,000. There that's are right. some other vehicles we're going to need to purchase for other parts of the fleet. Sandra mentioned we got 270 vehicles. Um, we're not ready to order those yet, but we are looking at some other options. Uh, probably going to get some pickups for planning and development inspection vehicles because those are really marketable now. We can flip those pretty quick and maybe take out some of our P&D inspection trucks and rotate them into the health department for some of their inspection vehicles. We've been working with Adam and uh, Kevin and Sandra and Rob Richards in the garage to kind of stage that, but the demand, uh, the supply is so short right now, so we don't quite know where they're going to. I just really wanted to underline that this is not all $500,000 right here. That's correct. Thank you, Peter. And if I could add, Mr. Chairman, um, what's coming forth is just the base vehicle. There are different options that will be right. chosen. And then the upfitting is different based on who's driving the car and what the needs are. But those are under other contracts. Um, so those aren't also included. In yeah, this. I thought you made that clear, too, in the presentation. Yeah. So thank you very much. OK, uh, any other questions? Any other? Any other? Seeing none, um, could we go to a roll call, please? Von Bergen? Yes. Noah? Yes. Young? Yes. Wagner? Yes. Altoff? Yes. Thorson? Yes. All right. Item number 6B3, a resolution authorizing the creation of two case manager positions, grade 7E, in the sheriff's office in the police social worker division. Do we have a motion? Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion. John Young makes a motion. Bob Nowak seconds it. Great. So this is exciting for us bringing forth this resolution for the creation of two social workers um, in our new program. Uh, last county board meeting, the funding went through for these positions. So now it's actually creating the positions. We worked with HR, and we're looking at um, bringing two on at this time. For this program, I have five contracts with other communities in hand. We're expecting two more this week. Um, we're hoping all of them come on board, but we do know there are some municipalities that are going to kind of step back this year and maybe do something on their own, but we've got a lot of participation. So right now, we know we have a need for two. Um, and we're hoping in the future to come back with the funding and, and creation of more positions for this. Thank you, Sandy. Any uh, questions? Any uh, any discussion from the members? I see none. Can we go to roll call, please? Wagner. Yes. Altoff. Altoff. I'm sorry, yes. Young? Yes. Von Bergen? Yes. Noab? Yes. Thorson? Yes. Item number 6B4, a resolution authorizing an agreement with the Office of the Illinois State's Attorney Appellate Prosecutor for fiscal year 2022. Anna? I mean, can we have a motion, please, to... Uh, I'll make a motion. John makes a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Tracy makes I'll a second. second. So this is a recurring agreement that we do every year. We are actually required by law to participate in this program. 
the Office of the Illinois State's Attorney Appellate, or State's Attorney Appellate Prosecutor, um, is the office that represents the county um, in criminal appeals that happen at the Illinois Appellate Court and at the Illinois Supreme Court. So, uh, you know, the State's Attorney's Office here prosecutes crimes at the district court level, and then the State's Attorney Appellate Prosecutor for those cases that go up on appeal represent uh, the people of McHenry County in those cases. Sometimes the State's Attorney <coughs> Appellate Prosecutor also um, acts as conflict counsel when there is a conflict within our office with some representation. Additionally, they provide training to our criminal prosecutors throughout the year. Uh, last year, this contract was $42,000. It's $1,000 less this year. Um, as you can imagine, $41,000 is significantly less than what the personnel costs would be to fund in-house appellate representation for the county. Thank you, Jana. We have any discussion from the members? I'm seeing none. There being none, can we go to a roll call, please? Noah. Yes. Wagner. Yes. Bob Bergen? Yes. Young? Yes. Altoff? Yes. Thorson? Yes. All right. Moving right along here under new business. Under other, we have a, dis a discussion on pending modifications to the liquor ordinance. Apparently, we don't have a, a physical presentation, like a written presentation, that we had an opportunity to review. So, I do have something for you at your desk. So okay, you can good. Can take a look at that? And Greg, I'm going to email you um, a copy of the document if it's possible to share the screen for the members who are attending remotely. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> So, but I can go ahead and just get going if sure. there's a way to do that. Um, so the first thing that you have up top is premises. And what you'll see, this is from the definition section of the ordinance. And as you can see, the existing definition of premises indicates that alcohol can only be served in the sort of physical structure of the business. Um, and this includes, uh, sometimes it can include sort of a deck, um, but again, it's mostly the physical structure. As you all know, you know, during COVID and post-COVID, we anticipate a desire from some businesses to sort of expand where they are serving alcohol to sort of make some make use of more of their outdoor spaces. Um, and so what I've done is to accommodate that is update the definition of premises to contemplate a sort of site plan review which would have a business, a licensee, come in and say, hey, this is where I would like to serve the alcohol. Um, it isn't just from the physical structure uh, and, and allow the liquor commissioner to sort of take a look at that site plan and see if sort of expanding the service area is something that we can do. Could I ask a question? Yes, of course. That's, that, then that would not require a variation or for any other reason to come before the, the board or the, this committee, correct? Uh, you could choose to do it if the liquor commissioner chose to do it, or he could ask, he or she uh, could ask for your recommendation on the site plan. This, the sort of one thing to note with all of these changes is that regardless of the status from the Liquor Commission's perspective, it still is gonna to need to meet the planning and development, the UDO requirements, and the health department requirements. So there may be some instances where the zoning of a certain business just cannot allow outdoor service. Um, so again, the site plan is meant to you know, have a concrete idea of where they're doing it, and to allow us to verify with p &D and with the health department that that's going to work out. Any other questions with regard to that part of this? Okay, so again, the goal of that definition change is to address the sort of changes in the way we see service um, and and where on a business's property service occurs, um, you know, post-pandemic. The next thing that I've done is I've provided you, as we've talked previously, 
with some changes to the license categories. Um, and the first one you'll see is a change to the Class W license. Um, we've talked about a couple of times that we have this Class W license, we call it a winemaker's license. In the ordinance, there's a definition of wine that only allows for wine to be considered something that's fermented fruit. Um, and as we've talked about before, there are no options, no um, license options currently in McHenry County that would allow for on-site production of beer or distilled uh, spirits and service at those locations. So what I suggest is just changing the Class W license to what I'm calling a Class P producer's license to include with the same requirements as the previous Class W license, um, beer or distilled spirits. Any questions? I don't see any. The next license category is the license category that I'm sort of looking for some input on. I'm calling this the Class M monthly license. And this license is geared towards the agritourism businesses in McHenry County. I know the county has a desire to sort of promote these businesses and make um, you know, their business activities more attractive. However, the Class A, the, the current sort of retail um, and on-premise liquor licenses can be prohibitively expensive for those, um, those sort of agro-tourism outputs. If they're only doing a fall festival for three months or if they're doing Christmas tree cutting for a month um, and they want to have some level of alcohol service um, going on with that, it's expensive <coughs> for them to pay the $1,500 license fee, $1,000 application fee for the entire year license. So what I propose is a monthly license where, um, and this could be sort of tailored to each in the, each individual business's needs with a maximum number of like maybe four monthly licenses that you can get um, in the course of a year. And then those businesses can choose which months work best for their business. The question that I have for you is, uh, or I have a couple, the first is, do you think four months should be the limit, or do you suggest some other number of... Uh... Committee, you have thoughts on that? So... Could, could I... Could we... I, I apologize. This is all talk. Could you do, I mean, language that says up to, and then if, if the liquor commissioner or if staff reviews a request or something and, and it raises a red flag, that would still give the board some latitude to determine that maybe four months may be too long, too short, but could, it, could the wording be something that gives us that kind of discretion? Yeah, so what I contemplate is individual monthly licenses. You would come in and you would get a license for one month. Or you could say, I'm gonna do three months. Then you would need three of those sort of monthly incremental licenses. Um, again, so that if someone wanted to do just one month, then they're only paying for one month. If they want to do all four months, they can pay for four months. Um, it's just at what point in time does it become a situation where really your business does depend a lot more on alcohol sales and you should probably be going and getting that uh, you know, retail, your class A, B or C license. Personally, I would think that anything more than six months would require a retail, um, you know, because you're really talking about half a year now, <coughs> you know, so I mean that, so we know the top, I think that would be a top end. Jana says four, we could say three, I don't know, it's Tracy? In most agritourism businesses run for four or five month time frame, so I think maybe limiting it to four might not be enough, but yet I think any more than six is beyond and they should go for a full license. I'm sorry everybody, I can't see you so you'll have to chime in. So it's, it's Kelly. I did not hear what Tracy said. I'd be interested that she is you know, part of this. <laughs> So most agritourism businesses run for four months or more, mostly more than four months. Um, 
I guess my question would be, would, would they be required to come on each month or could they come once and say... I think they can tell us we're doing a fall festival from August until November and get there for four months then. That's okay. fine. Yeah. yeah. And again, I mean, I think if you are a business and you are running farm weddings and that's like happening year round, you have a banquet hall facility, that is a sort of more central part of your business, you really should be getting a retail liquor license at that point. Is there, is there, do we have a liquor um, license that kind of um, pinpoints this kind of agritourism business that you pay a lesser cost and it's only valid for so many months? Because I agree with Tracy, everything that I've ever been exposed to or um, engaged in with regard to these kind of oh, outdoor event, you know, whether it's a festival or whether it's a wedding season, whatever it is, usually uh, on average runs, I, I would say, closer to five to six months, depending upon the weather. So, I, and you know, I, I see some of these businesses having to come in every single month. That just means that we have to do our job and do better inspections and make sure everything's going real well. But is, is there something in between there that, um, you know, somebody can, uh, you know, after a year, after two years, they have um, a license that's valid for specific months while they run a business? I mean, I think about Richardson, you know, and I know that, that you know, they know exactly what they're going to do every year for X amount of months. And it may not be a festival. It may be, you know, just a beer when people go out and do whatever. That's the goal with this license, is to sort of find the middle ground for these types of businesses. Because currently you can get a 24-hour liquor license, but you can only have 10 of those. So that's not <coughs> going to meet the needs of these businesses. And yet, as I explained, the full year license is going to be a lot more expensive. So I mean, I contemplated these monthly licenses where again it can be sort of tailored to the business and what they want to do uh, and then have a sort of $150 monthly fee associated with it. Well I think four months is probably too short. That's just my opinion. Well I think Tracy agrees with that. And I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm with you as well. Um, it seems to me that um, we have a, a top end of how, how many months in total. We could be flexible enough, it sounds like, to issue it by the month. We could issue it for 60 days, we could issue it for 90 days. Jana, correct me if I'm going in the wrong way. Yes, yeah, so my goal, again, yeah. is to, you tell me the top number of months where you right. think if they're gonna be selling alcohol out there for eight months, they should be getting a retail liquor license. Right. My goal is to say, if someone only needs a month, then they only have to pay 150 bucks. If they need six months, then they're gonna have to pay six times that. They don't have to come in. If they know what their plan is for the year, they don't have to come in every month and say, okay, I want November now. Now, we can approve six of those one month increments. The purpose of putting it into the monthly increment is to allow the businesses to tailor the license length and the cost of that license to their individual business needs. We're trying to make it easy for them, but not so easy that we're letting them skirt the need for a retail liquor license. Um, and also, they're going to have to get, again, an a Illinois special or temporary license. So we need to make sure that we are consistent with what they would need to get from the state of Illinois as well. So what I'm telling here, I agree with Pam and Tracy. I, I think we should, this should be six months. <coughs> um, agritourism, even if it's cold outside, it doesn't mean they're going to stop what they're doing. All right. I think that's a good direction. Uh, and then thoughts on cost. I had contemplated 
$150. That's based on 1500 a year, and then 10, if you, you know, if they... I would say they wouldn't need to pay the $1,000 application fee, and then, yeah, it's $1,500 a year for the retail license. Right. So again, they're having it's a shorter, smaller amount of time. Right, but it's, it, it's comparable with a little bit of a premium to what they would pay if they, I mean, on a monthly basis. So. I, also, I also looked at what we charge for the special Daily. licenses. So these are your Class S license, that's a one-day license or a one-weekend license at most. That's $150. Um, your Class F license, which is for fundraisers, um, so that has to be a charitable organization. And again, it's a 24-hour license. That costs $125. So I'm also trying to be fair and consistent with our other sort of special licenses that we give to other organizations like charities or special events. I just have a suggestion, Kelly here. Um, if we made it $200 for that month, would that be a little more equitable? Uh, equitable, if you're talking about how much it costs for a 24-hour license. And then at that point, if it is six months, that's $1,200. Some places may just decide, well, we're going to go seven months or more. We'll just get that whole year for $1,500. Well, there's a there's a the application fee also, correct? Yeah, you'd have to pay an application fee. I think we could waive an application fee for these businesses. Yeah, I'd like that. You thought think that we we can waive the application fee for these businesses. We're going to still have to pay for the background check associated with it, but that is can be forty five dollars maybe. You think you'll be inundated? I think the goal here, I'm sorry. Well, we don't typically do background checks for the one-day licenses, so it would just be the addition of the monthly. Okay. If you take what, I'm sorry, go ahead. Bob? Uh, could you, what, you know, what is the uh, application fee for the temporary uh, license? We don't have application fees, is that correct? Can no, we? only the permanent licenses. There's no application fee for a temporary license? No, for like a one-day license, no. No. So, and then there would be no application fee for this license either. But then if you went for a standard license, a regular one-year license, that application fee is $1,000? Yes. Is that annual? That's annual or is that one time? No, it's a one time. It's a one-time fee? Right. Okay. I was just curious. I kind of like uh, Kelly's idea of uh, $200 a month, uh, keep getting it up a little bit more uh, than the 150 for the one day. Because a, a weekend one-day fee, that's, that's already at $150. It should go at least 200 then. And there's no application fee, so that's pretty reasonable. I will, I still need to sort of look at the state uh, license scheme as well. I will think about what the total cost then would be and be able to bring that back to you when you guys vote on this so that you guys have all of the information you need on Perfect. how much this will cost them. Perfect. I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to end up with a with a one month fee that's less than one twelfth of what the normal uh, license would be. You know what I'm saying for the annual? Sure. Because you don't want to make it cheaper because that's an unfair advantage, I think. So, so it's got to at least be that's got to be the base. You know what I mean? Yeah. We have to cover the cost of the background check. Yeah. Yeah. I would just remind everybody though too that you know we're McHenry County is trying to encourage tourism and we really are relying a lot on the agritourism business so you know before we get all funky about what's fair and what's not fair just keep in mind i think that one of the goals that we've indicated even in our strategic plan is to provide opportunities for businesses to thrive because we get additional revenues on the, on the flip side with discretionary spending 
So, I, you know, again, maybe we go up to, maybe you start a little bit lower to encourage people to engage in this kind of activity. I mean, I, I just don't want to make it too high so that well, people say it's just not worth the time and the energy to do something like that. Because that's what we offer as a county. You know, the people come, is for people to come here and engage in our wonderful outdoor resources. So that's, you know, just five, at, five cents. But even at $200, it's still something more than what we offer today. And I think that if we, if we look at $200, play it by ear, see how it flies for the first year, and then have that discussion. But we still haven't figured, you've got to come back to us with more information anyway. So, you know, it's kind of premature to have the discussion on the, 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 the pricing there until we know, right? Right. So. And then if you see, um, you know, this is still going to have the sort of similar requirements to what our Class S license has, right? That, uh, you know, the licensee is going to need to provide information about their site plan, about what they're doing. Um, we will have to verify that they have the proper zoning and the health requirements are met. Um, you know, so, so there are going to be requirements that they have to meet as well. And then when I come back to you guys the next time, um, again, we've talked about doing a conservation district and a fairgrounds specific license. I will have language for that. Um, and then I wanted to talk again about the BYOB. Are you guys interested in creating a license um, for BYOB where a business can sort of register as a BYOB business? That way we at least sort of have them on our list that they're doing that there. Um, do we want to sort of work on a scheme for BYOB? Can I, uh, get under, I always thought that BYOB um, avoids a lot of the, the um, um, administration, am I correct? Yeah, again, so that would be something where maybe they came and they registered with us. They well, were we a restaurant, be, they're not going to get a retail liquor license. Um, we say, you come in. Can they do can, that now by statute? Uh, no, not, I don't know, or not in the current. What I contemplate is a new business comes in, they pay a $100 BYOB thing, they sign a document saying that they their servers won't touch the wine, they won't charge for this or that, um, but at least it puts us puts them on our radar that that is an establishment where sort of alcohol consumption is is happening. I think it also could address some of our catering issues to be perfect. And you'll have more more uh, input for us at the next. Yeah, just like I said, yeah. I want to know if that's a direction that you guys want to be going in. Because I never want to look like I am advocating for certain ordinance changes. To me, these are policy questions. Um, so I don't want to bring something to you and have you guys think, Jana really wants BYOB. <laughs> I don't care. Um, I'm just trying to help facilitate what the committee's goals are. I'd like to, I mean, I personally, I would like to see us at least consider it and have, give the opportunity to have a more of a public uh, discourse with regard to that. And perhaps, you know, after the next review, we can decide then, I think. Is that, does that sound fair? Sure. Everybody? I agree. Me too. Very good. All right, excellent. That's all I have. Thank you so today. much. Yeah. All right, next item up on the agenda is old business. Does anybody have any old business? Seeing none, Alicia, it's time for our legislative update. Oh, this is going to be a fun one. Yeah, i got a lot of questions. saying that she was going to be filing the um, 
Township Dissolution Repeal Bill that had just emerged from the Legislative Reference Bureau on Monday, 10.36 p.m. She responded on that. So first question. She said she'd be filing it shortly. So, got to say, I'm over the moon and excited about that. That's beautiful. There's also some other really good news coming out of our delegation to Springfield. If you'll notice, I got a little ambitious with our legislative update tracking sheet, put something in green, which I usually reserve for things that I'm pretty sure are going to pass. And that is House Bill 4169. So what's the big deal about this one? It, squ it squares directly with our legislative program and increases LGDF funding for local governments. It actually sets it. So exceedingly exciting, exceedingly exciting. And guess who's our chief sponsor on it? None other than our very own Stephen Wright. So our delegation is doing good for us this, this time around. Not that they don't always, but it's a really great year. If you'll, look, if you'll notice, there's a ton of sponsors on this bill already, including the speaker, and another eight have um, come onto the bill since um, I developed the spreadsheet. Now, thanks for you all to, be, to consider House Bill 5, House Bill 3824, House Bill 4169 um, have already been scheduled for hearing. I know it's not on your status, but that, but that particular committee's hearings have been rescheduled and rescheduled and rescheduled over the past couple of weeks because of a whole bunch of cancellations in the General Assembly. So that brings up another ask for you guys. Um, since we're actually having a committee on Thursday, the 27th, um, I would like, with your permission, to file a witness slip on behalf of the county board since it is in alignment with our um, with legislative bill? program. Um, that for income tax increase for LGDF that we file as the county as in support of that measure. Um, it has already had ISACO sign off on it and file a witness list, the Illinois Municipal League and various other municipalities. Um, if that's all right with you, because I, I wouldn't file without asking, but I, I would like to take that action. And I'm sure McCod would like to as well because that's the cornerstone of their legislative program. What do you all think? Problems with that? I see a thumb up. That looks good to me. Yeah. All right. All right. Let the record reflect that we endorse that. All right. Excellent. So hopefully this one will go through soon. I'm very excited to keep an eye on it and you know see where it goes. Like I said, House Bill Five is also up for hearing on the, on Thursday as well. Now, when I say up for hearing, I want to be very careful on this. Um, just because something is scheduled for hearing doesn't necessarily mean it'll be heard. There's, you know, several bills on the roster, so it may or may not happen. But again, I'm keeping an eye on it. Also, House Bill 3824, um, PTEL freeze. Um, I think this is one for us to keep an eye on because it will impact our budgeting decisions going forward in the spring. I took the liberty of reaching out to Senate, or sorry, Representative Reich's office since he is the one of the. Uh, He's the Republican spokesperson on that committee, and I did ask him, you know, uh, you know about about for a bit more information on this bill, and you know to see, you know, you know what you know what its chances are of going through and all that, so we have a better idea going forward um, what what we're looking at with this piece of legislation, and he is looking into it. Um, House Bill 1861, the township expanding the township bill. I know I'm going a little out of order here, but that one hasn't moved out of rules yet, so I'm kind of keeping an eye on it, but we'll see what happens with that one. And Senate Bill 3187 has some cleanup legislation for a bill that passed um, uh, with our reform for the recorder's office. I made sure to reach out to Mr. Tyria, make sure he was aware, he was aware of this legislation and is in support of it uh, as cleanup language. And I also wanted to make you aware of Senate Bill 3460. Um, um, I, I have a question for you. Do we have any background with regard to <clears throat> the sponsors or what was what, what motivated them for the expansion of the township dissolution? Um, with, what the genesis, was it because of our kicking and screaming a little bit about it? Or um, do you have any kind of insight? I apologize, I do not. Um, Representative Batnick is not going to be running again this time around. Um, 
and I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really know uh, Representative Carroll or Representative Willis, but I can look into it. Um, this bill was filed last session. Yeah, so I, always, I always assume though that uh, that that was probably a no go for you know most of the areas in Illinois. I would think. But well, I, I can't really say one way or the other, sir. But I will look at. Yeah, I, yeah. I'd be, I, I, I would wonder what the likelihood is that it goes through. You know, I mean, if there's any way we can measure that or gauge that, because I mean, that would definitely be more fair for us. But and we probably wouldn't be the first one to to go to the to the mat on. As we talked about it, if it was to be statewide, it sort of it becomes logical that some of the problems we encountered would get remedied. But this is kind of a long way to get to that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I get. If there's anything else you would like me to look into or any other pieces of legislation that are of interest to you, please let me know. And I will keep you updated as more bills impacting the counties come forward. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair. Yeah? Yeah, I, I think we need to have real quickly a conversation about um, our regional office of education efforts. I've been having conversations with Senator Wilcox as well as the ROE Association. And you know, there's there's not a lot of um, support um, in general for changing the current um, criteria and requirements for running for office. And, and our situation here in McHenry County has somewhat changed so the narrative of our story and why we felt it was important for us to look at expanding that criteria has somewhat morphed over the past you know couple of weeks that we actually had three candidates that met that criteria. So I, I just don't want to put Senator Wilcox on the spot in Springfield if he can't articulate the need for um, a something. So can we just have kind of a conversation on where we are right now with that um, thought process? You mean kind of give him a, you know, ease, ease the pressure and he can step back and if this doesn't happen, it doesn't happen? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, yeah. You know, again, it, it's going to, it would take a lot of work with him sitting down with the regional office of education and really hammering something out and they really don't necessarily want to do that. Um, and, and there's some um, consternation even amongst the board of the ROE Association, you know, members. So if, if we can kind of give them a, a pass on it and see if we can just continue to have those discussions and see what happens. But again, he actually had three individuals, you know, who applied for the position, all of them that are well qualified that expressed an interest in running. And so, and I would assume that, that, that that's going to be the case and it's going to be a broader um, field. So it kind of took away the impetus for why this was necessary. Kelly? So I just had a question on that. Running for office is different than getting appointed. It's much easier personally to just be appointed. So does anybody that was in those meetings with the um, applicants have any idea whether the they would be willing to run for office too. I think that's part of it. I mean, you normally it's it's a big decision. And if you're a teacher or an administrator, you may just want to go ahead and continue what you're doing instead of going through the whole rigmarole of running. So just wanted to get anybody's um, feedback on that. That question, I, I can answer. That question was actually asked of all of those individuals. And most of them indicated, certainly the um, lady that we just appointed, certainly Michael, who is the deputy, and I don't, uh, the third candidate I was relatively familiar with, but they were all asked that question um, because the whole point is why would we appoint somebody who wasn't willing then to take that next step. But more importantly, what I'm stating for our best is that our original assumption was we could not find qualified candidates who would run the And we did. We we get we met one, we found two more. I'm gonna say now that this may be an open office, you're going to find other people who meet the criteria as it's currently written in statute and there there will be much more interest in the office than there may have been in the past. So our need 
criteria may in fact not be viable enough for Senator Wilcox to have you know rationalization to ask people to consider that broad of a change. Following me? Did I explain I that? I, I, I do, and I understand. So, so you said all three of those candidates said they would they would run. It, it, it certainly if whether or not they'll change their mind between now and then. I can't. I, nobody can answer that question. Right. But ask the question, which means that they have the criteria. They're certainly qualified to run, and that will be in their their hands as you know things move forward. Right. I understand that. Yeah. What we thought was an extreme need to relax the standard, I think we've proven ourselves wrong, is what you're saying, right, Pam? Um, <laughs> I love you here, yes. <laughs> I mean, did I say it in a nutshell? Yes, you did. Okay. Clearly. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that? Yep. Bob? Can I say something? Yeah, I, I agree with Pam. Uh, uh, I think uh, last time when we looked at uh, the, the applicants, uh, that was back with the last group, and uh, there was a lot of criticism to the amount of criteria needed or the credentials needed, and uh, I think that's why we thought that way. But I, I agree this last time with these three applicants, I was really surprised myself to see that because last time we only I think we only had one applicant I don't remember exactly so uh, I agree we could ease off on that uh, re that request uh, Senator uh, Wilcox any other comments with regard to this Okay, I think that this committee at least uh, uh, is endorsing your uh, suggestion, Pam. Thank you. I'll, I'll share that with the senators. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. All right. Mr. Chairman, I've got a couple updates. That would be great. Thank you. Come on. Um, just two updates. The uh, one is on the issue of the, the metro rail yard. Been pursuing for a number of years. Today, uh, Representative Underwood is meeting in Crystal Lake with uh, Crystal Lake officials and Metro officials uh, to talk about a number of things. But I'm confident that one of the discussions they're going to be doing is is talk about the value of getting that rail yard out of mm -hmm. Crystal Lake. Of course, where would it go? It would go out west of Woodstock. Um, and Congressman uh, you know, Underwood is really conscious of COVID, and she's so she's got a really small group, so there isn't anybody with the county involved in that today. Um, similarly, on Friday, uh, Senator Duckworth is, is going to be here uh, to learn about the rail yard. It's going to be meeting with Metro officials and a small group of uh, county staff and, and Woodstock staff. Um, we're going to do a little presentation at the Opera House with some drone footage, you know, kind of showing the rail yard in Crystal Lake and what it would be in Woodstock. So I'm excited that we're getting attention from, from the state, uh, from the federal senators and, and Congress people. You know, the, the dollars aren't completely lined up yet because the infrastructure bill got narrowed at the end and, and that project kind of fell off. But there are a lot of dollars going to the state and we're trying to prioritize this as a state project now to get some of those state dollars pushed up here on the railroad. So that's, that's good news and we'll, we'll have more to report on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is today um, we are going to be putting in, in the mail invitations to our delegation to attend a meeting in this room on February 28th, and again, we're, we're going to kind of limit the crowd a little bit because of COVID, but what we are doing is we're having a kind of presentation from Jonathan McGee. Jonathan McGee is a deputy director of DCEO uh, for Regional Economic Development, and I've been talking with Jonathan um, about some of the DCEO opportunities, and what got me to Jonathan was pursuit of dollars for fiber. Uh, and we know that that's something that DCO has a lot of interest in, in helping us with. But as, as we were talking, Jonathan was really excited about talking about all the other new programs that DCEO is going to have with all this federal money. So Jonathan's going to do kind of a, a roundtable discussion for municipal officials involved in economic development, um, chamber types, um, and 
and we're going to have our delegation invited if they want to participate, uh, workforce staff. So that will be, uh, I think it's Monday the 21st, 28th, excuse me, at 2 o'clock in this room. That's all. Thank you, Peter. Well, since Jana left, I'm assuming there's no executive session, no need for executive session. Uh, with that, um, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We have a motion from Tracy. A second from Bob. A roll call, please. Bob Bergen. Yes. Young. Yes. Altov. Yes. Wagner. Yes. Wilbeck? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Thorson? Yes. 